Welcome to our Bible class. The Bible class topic has changed a little bit. If you're eagle-eyed, you would have seen it's changed from trees, plants, and oils to trees, plants, and grasses. And that's one of the benefits of actually doing a study. You know, before you start, you think you know what you want to talk about. When you start doing the study, you think, goodness me, I'm learning something about the Bible, and I better change the topic to match what the Bible says, rather than the topic that I thought it should be. So it's to be one, one of three, God willing. And the, the first key thing I think we must talk about is the opening principle. And the opening principle from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 46. And, and Paul is teaching us a, spirit, a very spiritual lesson there. And he's talking about the resurrected body. And he talks about the seed body and all the other good things we know. And he's using the analogy of a plant growth to talk about our development both falling into the ground and coming out of the ground. But the principle applies there. And the, the principle is that which that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. So the RSV actually re- renders it just slightly easier in, in modern English, where it says, it is not the spiritual which is first, but the physical and then the spiritual. You know, it's been a wonderful thing Chris Delphines have often said too, you know. It's, you, you, you look at the physical thing and then learn the spiritual lessons from it. So the best way to do this, if we want to learn about plants in the Bible, is to go to the origin of plants, to the physical origin of plants. And we need to go to Genesis for that. So Genesis chapter 1, from verses 9 to 13 is the section which gives us the the great description about plants. God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and a fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself, after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So, an important point to realize when we're reading Genesis and it really is absolutely critical. If we look at Genesis as a technical, biological description of creation, we are going to be very disappointed. And I can't underline that enough. And it's very important, even in today's modern Christadelphian world, because of all the difficulties that exist relating to evolution, etc., that we don't try and force more out of Genesis than what is in there. Because what's in there is really important. And what's in there are principles. Genesis is about teaching principles and precepts and beginnings rather than technical details. Because if we get into the technical details, God would have reasons which were far bigger than our minds to ever understand. It goes without saying Even the best biologists couldn't get it. So if we're going to get into those types of arguments, we're going to come unstuck with Genesis. We stick to what the scripture says, let the scripture speak for itself. And when you do it that way, you learn wonderful things. So let's start looking at some of these wonderful things that come out of Genesis. So what we've got in day one, obviously, is the separation of day from night. So, light is the great quality of God. The absence of light is darkness. So, it's either where God is or where God isn't. It's a separation of those two. Then the next thing is, there's an atmosphere that's created. An atmosphere above and an atmosphere beneath. But day three stands out very differently to all the other days. Day three has got two components to it. Look at those. The first part is... There's earth standing out of the water, which forms dry land in the sea. The second part of day three are the plants, which are grasses, herbs, and trees. It's actually got two components in one day. 
All the other days are actually self-contained. Day four, the lights become visible as bodies to an observer on the earth, sun, moon, and stars. They were there long before the beginning of the earth, but they're now visible on that, uh, the fourth day. There was aquatic and avian life created. Then there was earth life, and that's described as cattle, creeping things, and beasts. And then human life. And it says that God created them, male and female. We know that's asynchronous, isn't it? Because that didn't all happen. On that one day, we know that Eve was created as part of a process. So it's teaching principles plainly, isn't it? And then, of course, there's the day of rest. Now, if you have a look at Genesis, um, the Genesis creation week, it's fundamentally divided at that juncture between day three and day four into two key principles. That which happens before then is the principle of separation. Day separated from night, the atmosphere beneath from the atmosphere above, separation. The separation of the, the, the dry land from the sea. And then there's separation so that the sun, moon and stars can be, be seen. And that's when the work of creation actually happens. And I need to emphasize that. Creation wasn't the creation of light in day one. Read it carefully. Day two wasn't the creation of the atmosphere, it was the separation of a firmament that was there. Day three wasn't the creation of dry land, it was the separation of dry land from sea. It was separation. Day four wasn't the creation of the sun, moon and stars, it was the separation so they could be visible. And then it says, and God made, and God made, and God created. Read Genesis very carefully and you'll see that the first part is about separation the next bit about creation, and you can see where this is leading in terms of principle. Separation precedes a new creation. It has to be. Now, it's very interesting too when you start looking at this at different levels. That which was created in day two and day three support the plants of day three B, the second part of day three. So, what went before has to sustain what happens in the second part of day three. But then the plants themselves are the, the, the bottom of the food chain for aquatic and avian life, and all earth life as well as human life. So they then go on and in exchange support other things, the things that came thereafter. So, the plant life section is very important. It, it splits the juncture between the things that were in preparation with the base of the food pyramid on which all of these things are fundamentally based. And there we have that remarkable day, day four, when the lights are created or, or, or made visible on the earth. They were in existence before, but now they're made visible. And the sun and moon and stars are made visible now with the key understanding that the sun, moon, and stars were to rule. And when you go and look at the Hebrew word for rule, it actually means rule like a ruler. In other words, have kingship. And when you think about what the stars, the sun, moon, and stars have kingship over, they're important for, if we start with the atmosphere, for the atmospheric movement. They're important for the earth and the water and the tides, and all of the things relating to the basic geology of the earth. They're important for plant growth. They're important for aquatic and avian life, even the seasons where penguins go off and mate, and then they come back to the Arctic. It's all driven by the visibility of light. The, the habits and the, the birthing of animals takes place according to light and according to the calendars of the celestial objects. And our lives do too. And we are governed by the sun and the moon and the stars. They rule over these dominions. So the principle of rulership of the celestial over the terrestrial is being established. So God, you see, is teaching principles. He's not getting into the science, but he says there are going to be bodies terrestrial and bodies celestial. And the celestial will rule the terrestrial. And to give you a little subset of it, 
God says, I will let man have a little subset of rulership. And he uses a different Hebrew word for dominion, called dominion. Didn't say he will rule over the earth, he will have dominion, which means it's the word to crumble or to flake. In other words, he'll be able to break off pieces for his use. He'll have use over the physical earth, over the animals, and over the plants. Man will have limited dominion over the earth. So it's a remarkable principle that we're getting taught here. And you'll, you'll see in a moment why we go through these, these points. So day three was an absolutely remarkable day in the creation calendar. Because it was twice on that day that Elohim declared that it was good. And just a little thing while we're on it. We tend to separate without good um, Hebrew basis or a Hebrew uh, backing the difference between Yahweh and Elohim in Genesis. Elohim speaks of God himself. And we understand that it's God in a multiplicity, but Elohim speaks of God. God looked at his very own creation and said it was good. And he said it twice in one day. And why did he have to say it twice in one day? Because the first part of day three was not enough. There was the separation of the earth from the sea, but it was not enough to, for God to say it was good. You didn't say, see that God said at the end of the separation of the earth and the sea, it was good, and then he said it was good after the plants, did he? It was not good enough until the plants were generated on the earth. So the first step was not enough. And then something very important to notice. Elohim did not create the plants. Did you notice that? Have a look at that very carefully. Elohim didn't create the plants. It was the work of the earth in obedience to his command. Isn't that remarkable? You see... And this is why I say if we get tied up in the technical details, we start getting lost in mumbo-jumbo about what God did and didn't do. All of everything was under God's creative power, but that, that slight difference actually matters from a principle's perspective. And why is that so important? Well, it's so important for this reason. Let's have a look at these principles in action. We know that water covered the face of the deep. The earth was covered in water. And the spirit of Elohim brooded over the surface of the water. He was brooding like a dove waiting for something to happen. And God spoke. We know that the spirit word is God thinking and then speaking. The speaking is the end result of God thinking. His purpose, his plan. So God spoke. And what happened? The dry land appeared. And it was called earth. And it was separated from the sea. It was a product of the sea. It was under the sea and came out from the sea and was separated to be a different thing. But then God spoke a second time. But you see, it's the Spirit of God that is eff efficacious to make change. It's the thing that makes the change. So, Ruch Elohim, the breath of God, gives the earth a command. And the earth responds. That's the important principle we've got to try and take away from, that to, from this tonight. The earth is separated. The earth is told to do something. And the very earth itself responds to the command of God. <coughs> and the earth brings forth plant life. Isn't that remarkable? And this is the wonderful thing about reading the Bible. We've read these verses how many times? And it doesn't dawn on you. There was actually the earth that brought forth, not God. It was trees, herbs, and grass. And we'll go into that in detail. Now, that first stage, stage that brown stage, when the, the, the dry, earth, dry land was, was separated from the sea, there's some very important principles that pop out there as well. The Hebrew word yabasha is used in Genesis 1 verses 9 to 10, as a dry, waterless land, a land without plants. So if you actually track that through Englishmen, and you go through the Bible, 
you'll find that it's a place that's not just sandy, it's sandy without plants. So it's a separation of sand and soil from water, but plantless. It's the basic building blocks, because that's where the chemicals are contained, it's the basic building blocks to sustain life. Again, you'll find that it's used in Exodus, Exodus 14 to 15, and almost every other place it's used that Yabasha is referring to the Exodus in Scripture. It's very interesting. It's not a frequently used word, that dry land, but when it's used, it's most frequently used referring to the Exodus. And those are the references there. You can get those if you wish afterwards. So that's Exodus 14, verse 16, 21, 22, 29. And Exodus 15, verse 9. That's that Yabasha. And that's where it speaks of dry land. It's specifically used in terms of the Jews leaving Egypt. Now, the ones who were leaving, of course, were the Israelites. And they were walking through the sea. And they were walking on dry land. Right behind them came the Egyptians in their footsteps, but it's never once spoken that they walked on dry land. It says every single time when the Egyptians walked, they walked in the sea, and those are the verses to show it. Israel was on dry land, Egypt was in the sea. And you can see the principles getting formed, can't you? The principles of separation between Egypt and the Sea of Nations and Israelite to be, Israelites to be separate, to be on the dry land, are absolutely there. So if you go to the analogy that we've been talking about, so think about Genesis now, and transplant it to the time of the Exodus. What did God cause to blow to make the, the land dry, so that the Jews could walk over on dry land? It was a strong east wind. Isn't that remarkable? There in Genesis, there is the Ruach, the breath of God, the breath of Elohim, that separated the earth from the, the, the sea. Now here, a strong east wind separates Israel and causes Israel to walk on, on dry land. And we know that this principle is the principle of baptism. Paul picks it up in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 2. That the Israelites were being baptized into Moses when they went through on dry land. You could see them, and then you couldn't see them, and then you could see them again as they came out, came out the other side. It looked like they went into water, but they went on dry land. Their birth as a nation was on dry land. So a strong, roaring east wind blew the sea apart. But then when God wanted to reveal himself, what did he do? He spoke to them in a still small voice. Isn't that the remarkable thing? The same self, same power that God could use to move water would speak to them, to their souls, in the still small voice. And God gave Israel a command to be fruitful. It's no good just coming out of Egypt, Israel. You have to be fruitful. He was, they were constituted as a nation, baptized into Moses. But they were raw. They were dry earth. Something had to happen. So God gave them a command to be fruitful. Israel had to bring forth fruit. It was a two-stage process. And then Israel brought forth fruit. And that was the purpose of that. Have a look at Isaiah 27 verse 6. Isn't that wonderful? Israel's purpose as a nation... It said that they must now blossom and bud and fill the face of all the world with fruit. It's plainly symbolic. See, this was the principle that God was trying to say to Israel. It's no good coming out of Egypt and lusting after all the fruits of Egypt which caused you death. Come into the wilderness and bring forth the fruit of life. And that was what God was trying to tell Israel to do. You must bring forth fruit that fills all the world with your fruit. So, if you go to Psalm 1, I mean, isn't that a wonderful principle? That Those are fruit trees that don't wither. That's not literal. Obviously, it's a symbolic thing, talking about this man who is delighting in the law of God. The very words of God 
are his delight and it causes him to bring forth fruit in his season. Whatever he's going to do is going to prosper. That was the principle that God was laying down for Israel. So how do we apply this analogy to ourselves? Well, we know that the spirit word is the thing that separates us at baptism. Have a look at John chapter 1. So we know that obviously the the, the rebirth in Christ is, is a baptism because we've left the old life. We've left the Sea of Nations. And what was the thing that caused us to be separated? It was the Spirit Word that worked in us. And isn't it inter- interesting that when you speak to people who want to accept the truth, the, sp- the Spirit Word of God is so compelling in them, it is a strong east wind that causes a separation from the sea. It gets to a point where they say, I can't wait any longer. I have to be baptized. I've got to be separated. It's not a gradual separation. They get to a point where they have to be separated. The spirit word acts as a strong east wind. And then the spirit word blows in our lives to tell us to be fruitful. And that command means that we've got to yield the fruit of the spirit. Now, it's very interesting that Jesus picks this principle up in Matthew 13. He says that all of us have got to bring forth fruit. We're not all the same. We're not all in the same circumstances. But we all have to bring forth fruit. We can't sit back at the brown stage just being dry, lifeless soil. All of us have got to do something. And Jesus says some bring forth 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. But it's got to be more. And you know what? Christ actually expects an awful lot. But you know how the farmers in those days used to work? They didn't go to Monsanto and buy their grain at the beginning of every season and plant it. They would keep a little back from last year's harvest, and if they were smart, they would keep the biggest, fattest grains back. They would keep them in a storehouse and keep it nice and dry, because that would be the planting grain for the next year. And then they would then go carefully sow that, and they would expect an increase. Do you know what the typical increase was for farmers in those days? They didn't have the modern yields that our farms have. It was about five times. So for every one kilogram of grain you put in, you've got five out. Jesus says, you must bring forth 30, 60, 100. That's what I'm expecting of you. Because the grain that's in you is a very special grain. It's not like anything else that you're used to. It will change you, it will change the people around you, if you nurture it. And that's the wonderful thing. Jesus expects much more than a normal farmer would. And the end result of this, of course, Jesus says, Herein is my Father glorified, John 15 verse 8, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. And it's a lovely way of of Jesus saying that. He says, My Father is glorified. You're not glorified by being fruit bearers. It's showing that God's entire process hasn't failed. The Spirit word blew and blew and there was a response. And you worked with the Spirit word to bring forth fruit and God is glorified in the end of it. And Jesus says if you bring forth much fruit, that defines discipleship. So shall ye be my disciples. I will measure your discipleship based on your fruit. And that's quite a a sobering lesson for each of us to think about. So the second part of that day deals with the plant kingdom. And if you look at the structure of of Genesis 1 verses 11 to 12, I'm going to read it to you from the Jerusalem Bible. And the Jerusalem Bible says, and it's structured quite nicely because it's structured into two parts. God said, let the earth put forth grass, seed-bearing plants, and fruit trees, each yielding its own kind of seed-bearing fruit on the earth. And that's how it was. You see, that's the lovely thing. God says it, and that's how it is. It's not open to debate. God says, this is what I want. You can't say that I've got another sacrifice or another thing that God says, I want it so. And you have to obey And in that, my Father's glorified, says Jesus, because you bring forth fruit. So the earth brought forth grass, plants each yielding its own kind of seed, 
and trees each producing its own kind of seed-bearing fruit. Every single line item of the command was met by a response. Every single one. Because you see, we have to literally take what God says and put it into practice. Do you know, not one word of the Bible is there for no purpose. Dennis Gillett always taught us that, and he's right. So why go through that description? Why not just say green plants? Why split it into those three? Well, for very good reason. The base level of all of this we've seen was the earth being separated from the sea. That's the basic part. The next part are the grasses, the, the low-level plants, the ones that are you know, up to 20, 50 centimeters high, a meter high, the grasses. <coughs> the next layer are the plants, the ones which are slightly higher, and it says they produce seed. And the last one are trees producing seed and fruit. So you've got the canopy layer at the top, the smaller layer in the middle, and then the grasses at the bottom. Three distinct layers of height. It's very interesting to see that of the grass, it doesn't talk about the seed. Now we know that grasses produce seed. It's, it's, it's a fact of biology. So this is getting back to my point again. We're not doing a biology lesson here in Genesis. If we were, we'd be getting muddled and having to think up crazy answers. God is trying to teach principles. So here are the principles. Grass has got tiny seeds, but they appear insignificant. The plants produce better seed, but the trees produce seed with flesh around it, fully formed, much more delicious, much more appealing, lifted up. And it's not insignificant that God then chooses the trees in the Garden of Eden to be the symbol on which he places his highest principles. The tree of life, the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Not on the herb of tree of life or the grass of the knowledge of good and evil. The trees were the highest form of God's creation. These were the ones that produced the end result that God was truly after. And you could think about it as the grass producing the smallest of seeds. And, you know, wheat is, is a form of grass. It's a domesticated form of wild grass. Or plants that produce seed, you know, angiosperms, flowering plants. And then trees producing seed and fruit. And all the beautiful things you can imagine. And you can see the progression that God is trying to teach. From, you know, the most basic, minimal, the 30-fold, to the 60-fold, 80-fold, up to the 100-fold is what God really wants. He's wanting the best. And if you actually take it into the history of the Jews, you actually see that this three-fold demarcation is there right throughout the law of Moses. Have a look at this. That three-fold demarcation is there in the grain, the smaller grasses, the wine, the vineyards, and the oil in the olive trees. The three heights. Isn't that interesting? And if you think that's a stretch, think about the number of times in scriptures you've read those words. Here's an example. Numbers 18 verse 12. The best of the oil, the best of the wine, and of the wheat, the first fruits of them, which they shall offer unto the Lord. Oil, wine, wheat. Isn't that interesting? It's, it's part of the key contribution that God is speaking of. Very often, you'll find that those three are all bundled together as the perfect sacrifice, as an example, that God is requiring from us. And you see, in an ecclesia too, we're not all olive trees or, or, or grains or, or wines. It's the connection together of all of our different capabilities that are fruitful to God. Not all of us can be one thing or the other, neither should we be, because the ecclesia needs the difference. That's why it's so healthy that we are different in the ecclesia. And we've got grain, and we've got wine, and we've got oil. And that wonderful combination is used repeatedly for Israel in Scripture. 
And if you have a look at how it's used in Scripture, you'll see that it says, the earth brings forth grain and wine and oil. And the wonderful thing is that when Israel, as representative of the earth, remember Israel was the dry land, when Israel brought forth spiritual grain and wine and oil to God, when they had their spiritual priorities right, when the priesthood was right, when they were offering their offerings right with a willing heart, what did God do? They got growth. And God bless them. And you see this as an, a, a very good example in Joel chapter 2. But somebody pick that up for me. Joel chapter 2 uh, at verse 24. And just read that as an example. Joel chapter 2 at verse 24. Joel 2, 24. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. The fats. Yes. <laughs> and you see, verse 23, thanks Colin, is, this is a time when the children of Zion are glad and rejoicing in Yahweh their God. And, and when they're doing the right spiritual thing, God says, I'm going to give you blessing. You see, because what, what God is trying to say is, I will prepare you. And you've got to bring forth things to me. When you bring forth those things to me, the earth has to bring forth to God as a, a sacrifice, a voluntary thing. You see, God couldn't bring these things to be. I mean, technically he could. But he wanted the earth to bring it into, into being. And in the earth bringing it into being, it gave glory to God, and God responded with rain and blessing to nourish them even physically. So what was happening here was a virtuous cycle. Here the farmers of Israel, spiritual farmers, were working with God who wanted them to bring forth fruit. When they brought forth fruit, God blessed them. And they were nourished as a people. They were protected, they, they had peace from the enemies. And God caused rain to fall from heaven. And the opposite happened too. When the grain and the wine and the oil ceased... Where there was no spiritual growth to God. Joel 1 verse 10. Davy, would you read that for us? The crops of the field have been destroyed. The ground is in mourning because the grain has perished. The fresh wine has dried up. The olive oil languishes. Isn't that interesting? So exactly the same three used again, you see. If you are spiritually deficit, God causes a physical uh, reaction with Israel, but he caused no blessing to come upon them. And the skies were like leaden. There was no rain. Because you see what's happening here. Look at the, the first cycle. The first cycle is where there's working together with God to bring forth fruit. The second one is where there's working against God. The earth doesn't want to give. Therefore God can't respond in kind. And there's an animosity, a gap, between God and the earth. God is wanting the plants to grow up towards him, to the source of light. That's what phototropism is with, with plants. They grow towards the light. It's the natural thing with a plant to grow towards the light. We've got to grow up towards the light of God. And this is the principle that God is teaching. Without it... There's this horrible gap between God in heaven and us on earth that is not fulfilled. So the application to natural Israel was that Israel's blessings for obedience and bringing forth fruit were given in Deuteronomy. Have a look at Deuteronomy 11 verses 13 to 14. Got it, Sean? Yep, verses 13 to 14. 
fantastic. They're the three again, aren't they? Grain, wine, and oil. And it's commensurate on people bringing forth spiritual growth, which was verse 13. See, Israel has been taught these principles. Have a look at Nehemiah chapter 5 at verse 11 to show what happened. Because remember, the vine of Israel was destroyed by the invaders, both north and south. And after the restoration under Ezra and Nehemiah, have a look what Nehemiah says in Nehemiah 5 verse 11. Isn't that wonderful? The, the whole restoration, part of the restoration was the restoration of these physical principles because the people had gone back desirous of doing the right thing, that the copy of the law should be brought out and once more read, that they should rebuild that which was broken down. And as a consequence, Nehemiah could intercede for them and ask for these three key things, those three plant groups, to be restored for them. And then, of course, we know after the northern invader is vanquished, if if you have a look at Joel 2, verse 19, and this is wonderful because if you take the whole analogy to Israel being destroyed completely once again in the future um, on on the, the, the mountains of Israel and none coming to her aid except Christ, you, you think that's the end of them. But once again, there's restoration, like in the days of Nehemiah. Um, Nebo, have you got that? Joel 2, verse 19. Once again, the three products. Isn't it interesting? Every single time. Because it had its roots in the offerings, the perfect offerings of Israel, of their own produce, which they created willingly to God. And of course, that's, Verse 20 is talking about the removal of the northern army to drive them then into a land barren and and desolate. And then, of course, we've got this wonderful principle of now the extension of that to all people in the kingdom. Have a look at Jeremiah 31, verse 12. Isn't that wonderful? So this is the context, Jeremiah 31, of the restoration of Israel, purged Israel to her rightful place amongst the nations as the head of the nations um, under God. And again, oil, wine, and wheat are the three components that are given. And that that principle then pervades into the kingdom. So the application to spiritual Israel is is obviously then the one that is is really critical to us. And Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, And the fruit of the Spirit is, and have a look at this. I've laid it out like this very carefully. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's not three anymore. It's three times three. It's absolutely wonderful. It's multiplied in the kingdom. And this is what... Christ is expecting of us now. He expects that we should develop these fruits because he wants us to be even more abundant than Israel. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's the very antithesis of the world in which you live. It's what we've got to bring forth as basic dry ground ourselves to make this world fruitful. And we've got to look in our own hearts to see how those are actually developed in our behavior with our brethren and sisters, with the people in the world around us. Because this is what God says he's going to measure our fruit on. You've got the seed. The seed is given to all of us. But have you brought forth fruit? That's the hard question. You see, are we going to be a junior grain, just have the basics? Or are we going to really bring forth fruit and have a fleshy fruit around the seed? This is what God's asking of us. So that new creation in Christ is given for us in Galatians 6, verses 15 to 16. And Galatians is is an absolutely wonderful treasure trove of understanding these principles. And why this is so important is that the new creation in Christ, and that's what that word in verse 15 should be. It's not a creature, it's a new creation. You see, in Christ it doesn't matter that you were a natural Jew. Because he can make you a spiritual Jew. He says, you need to just be a new creation. You've, you've been brought out of the soil and formed as a new, new creation. What are you doing? 
Because God says, if you walk according to this rule, you are going to be the Israel of God, even if you're not born of Israel. I mean, Israel had all those principles, as we've just read, um, presented to them. So what applied to Israel applies to us as the new Israel of God. You see, it doesn't matter what we, where we're from. It doesn't matter our backgrounds, nothing, high bred, low bred, in, you know, whatever, green, white, or blue. It just doesn't matter anything about our past. What really matters is that we all recognize we are, as Paul says, of the earth earthy. That's our base state. It really matters what we become after the pattern of faith. Have a look at Galatians 3, verse, verse 29. And the use of seed is absolutely imperative in Paul's argument. Never minimize this. And I'll, I'll show it to you why in a moment. So the use of seed in, in Galatians is absolutely imperative. And go through it very, very carefully because it ties directly back to Genesis. So if you had to summarize the path for us as believers, and you go to Galatians 3 verse 27... That's where we emerge from water. Galatians gives this entire process for us. We emerge from water, Galatians 3.27. We're no longer part of the sea of nations. We are now separated in Christ. We are rooted and grounded in the shared faith of Abraham, Galatians 3.29. It's one faith for Jew and Gentile. And that's the basis of our belief. It's something that happened before the law. Abraham's faith existed before the law existed. So the earth, the basis on which we grow, existed pre-law. It is beyond the law. And then we are seeded, and this is where Galatians 3 verse 16 comes in, from the one seed. And that's why Paul is at pains to say, he didn't say seeds of many, but seeds of one. There is one good seed it's Christ. We are his offspring. Because Mark 4 verse 8 describes it as the seed that brings forth increase. This is the most fructifying, grain-yielding seed that you could ever wish. We are, look at the sheaf of, of, of grain here because of Christ. And there's a sheaf in Durban and a sheaf in Adelaide and a sheaf in, in Brighton. There's sheaves of 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 seed because there was the one perfect seed, the one seed of Galatians 3 verse 16. So that's the grain. And then it says that we labor in one vineyard, Galatians 3 verse 28. It says it doesn't matter whether we're Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female. Because we remember in Matthew 21, the parable of the vineyard, God had his vineyard and he hedged it about and cared for it and he kept all the wild animals out and he, he digged it and he nourished it. But his own people let it go to rack and ruin. So God said he will get rid of those husbandmen and get other husbandmen in, other farmers, to come and look after the vineyard. He didn't change the vineyard. It was one vineyard. He changed the husbandmen. So you see, whether we're Jew or Gentile, we work in the one vineyard. This is the vineyard of Christ. We're working in God's vineyard. Because, you see, when you have a look at the prophecies from Genesis of Joseph's son, he was, his son was like a branch that ran over the wall. There was the wall that demarcated the end of the vine, the vineyard, but the branch ran over to the Gentiles, and it brought the Gentiles into covenant relationship so that they could become part of the one true vine of Israel. So now we've got the grain and we've got the vine. And the last one, we have to produce the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23. And you and I know from Zechariah, the prophecy of Zechariah, of the two olive trees who have their branches connected to the one candlestick, the hope of Israel. And they both, Jew and Gentile, wild olive and natural olive, are producing the oil, the final product of beautiful fruit, in the boughs, the highest trees, to produce oil to feed the one lamp, the hope of Israel. And then that is, this is this wonderful principle. Grain, the one grain of Christ, the one vineyard, and the one hope of Israel. 
And they bound up in the grain and the vine and the oil. And that's our hope. So our concluding thoughts then, dear brothers and sisters, comes from Matthew and, and one other verse in, in James. In Matthew 7, I'm reading to you from the Jewish Bible. And Jesus is warning the disciples to beware of false prophets. He says, you're going to recognize them by their fruit. In other words, if you look at a tree, you should know it by its fruit. Now, anybody who's doing botanical uh, classification, trying to look at the taxonomy of plants and work out is it this plant or that plant, some plants look very similar. Uh, I'm no botanist at all, but the people who do tell you, sometimes the leaves look very similar when you get the fruit. You can tell one from the other. You can see it's a different plant based on its fruit. By their fruit, you recognize what type of tree they are. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And the opposite is also true. For a healthy tree produces good fruit. A poor tree produces bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit. Or a poor tree, good fruit. You see, and this is where the real self-examination comes in. When we look at our own fruit that we are producing, and you look back at a year, you know, I don't know if you do it, but you look back at a year that goes past and you think, David, what have you done with a year of your life? Have you really done the things that bring forth fruit? And you start counting them off and trying to work out, have you actually moved on or moved backwards as a person in Christ? You know, the quality of the fruit determines the nature of the tree. You can see by the fruit what's actually going on really inside. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. If you are healthy inside you're not going to do the wrong things. You're going to bring forth good fruit. And the converse is also true. And the warning is, of course, that any tree that, tree that doesn't produce good fruit isn't actually worth anything. It's cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. And that's the sobering lesson to all of, all of us. God is so good to Israel. He is so good. Spiritual Israel and natural Israel. But so long as we grow up, produce fruit towards him. If we don't, we're purposeless. We're just another piece of dead wood. So our last verse then is from James, again also from the, the, the Jewish Bible. The wisdom from above is, first of all, pure, then peaceable, kind, open to reason. You can see that the same principles as the fruit of the Spirit. Full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy. You see, James says that these things actually come from above. The principles are heavenly principles. Because remember, it was God spoke the word, the earth responded and produced the fruit that reflected the principles. So these are heavenly principles from above. And he finishes off by saying, peacemakers who sow seed in peace will raise a harvest of righteousness. And peacemakers in scriptural terms are the shalom makers. And it's not just peace as in it's quiet and everything's fine, no trouble. Peace in in the Hebrew language is about binding together. And we, brethren and sisters, when we have issues with one another, other ecclesias, whatever problems we all go through, the key principle we always have to strive for is binding together. And that's why we've got to try and sow seed in peace to harvest righteousness. And may we all truly be, be there in the end at that great time when we are counted. You know, it's, it's quite shocking that, and we'll, we'll maybe look at it next week about the wheat and the tares. They are so inseparable until the end. They're so inseparable. And our hearts can deceive us. So we've got to look at these things, these wonderful principles. So it's very heartening that Genesis is teaching us these things and not teaching us biology.